largest, most complex, and most expensive machine ever devised by man was turned on. The Large Hadron Collider, or LHC, is a 17-mile-long ring of superconducting electromagnets buried approximately 300 feet beneath the ground near the city of Geneva on the Franco-Swiss border. Chilled to temperatures colder than the void of outer space, and generating a magnetic field more than a hundred thousand times that of the Earth's. This machine accelerates proton particle beams to a velocity just under the speed of light and then smashes them together in particle detector chambers in order to break apart the nuclei and unloose the subatomic secrets of matter. At full power, the LHC produces roughly 600 million collisions per second, creating fleeting, minuscule atomic explosions up to a million times hotter than the interior of the sun. The data collected from these collisions is processed by the worldwide LHC computing grid, one of the most extensive and powerful computing grids on the planet. The grid, as it is known, builds on the technology of the World Wide Web, which was invented at CERN. In 1989, the Large Hadron Collider is the primary research instrument of the European Organization for Nuclear Research, otherwise known as CERN. After the devastating detonations of Fat Man and Little Boy over Nagasaki and Hiroshima at the end of World War II, mankind was irrevocably thrust into the atomic age. In accordance with the inevitability thesis, which posits that once a technology is introduced into society, what follows is the inevitable development of that technology. The scientific community, impelled by military interests around the globe, became obsessed with the idea of harnessing the power of the mighty atom and unraveling the very fabric of physical reality at the subatomic level. CERN is the largest scientific consortium in the world, involving thousands of top physicists from 21 member states, all working in tandem to discover the fundamental elements that hold the universe together. While this admitted objective of CERN seems innocent enough, and even laudable in a sense, there are deep concerns about potential unintended consequences and probable occult intentions. When analyzing a scientific endeavor as costly and ambitious as CERN, it is essential that we have a realistic understanding of the mechanisms and machinations that have been propelling technological advancement in the modern era. In a perfect world, the greatest accomplishments of science would be the product of goodwill toward men and the desire for peace and prosperity. However, in the practical world, the world in which we live, the greatest accomplishments of modern science are often facilitated and funded by men who have anything but goodwill and peace on their minds. In many cases, the most groundbreaking technological advancements, such as in the case of jet propulsion, rocket science, and nuclear fission, have been intentionally directed by incredibly malevolent individuals for dark and dangerous purposes. Scientists are rarely the evil villains scheming sinister plots and secret laboratories that Hollywood is often portrayed, with a few glaring exceptions of course, and are usually zealously dedicated to their particular field of study with noble or benign intentions at heart. However, this kind of religious commitment to science can engender blind apathy, if not willful ignorance, concerning the overarching implications and ill intentions of the benefactors facilitating their work. This is certainly the case of the brilliant men and women working at CERN, most of whom naively believe that the prime objective of their research is to merely understand what the universe is made of and how it all started at the Big Bang. Unfortunately, 
What they fail to realize, apart from the fact that they're working from a false premise to begin with, is that their research is very likely being used to advance a hidden agenda, the conspirators of which are well aware of who created the universe and are absolutely intent on making war with him and enthroning another in his place. CERN is an acronym derived from the French rendition of the designation European Council for Nuclear Research, which was a provisional council organized in the early 1950s with critical backing from the United Nations, whose task was to plan for the construction of a multinational European research facility that would be dedicated to the study and advancement of nuclear physics. On the 29th of September 1954, the Provisional Council was dissolved and the European Organization for Nuclear Research, or CERN, was born. As an interesting side note, the infamous Bilderberg Group was also conceived that same year, exactly four months later, on the 29th of May. Both of these organizations enjoy diplomatic immunity. Although the Provisional Council had been dissolved, Paradoxically, the acronym of CERN remained, even though it did not correspond to the title of the new organization. It was distinguished physicist and one of the key pioneers of quantum mechanics, Werner Karl Heisenberg, who had inexplicably insisted that the original acronym of CERN remain in effect, as Tom Horn elucidates in his book, On the Path of the Immortals. Werner Heisenberg understood quite well what quantum physics implied for humanity. Inherent within this theoretical realm, populated by obtuse equations and pipe-smoking scientists, lies what I call the Babylon potential. This is the secret knowledge, the scientific imperative, informed and driven by spiritual advisors, that the Bible cites as the key to opening a gateway for the gods. It is Ente Menaki, Baba Alu, the opening of the Abzu, the doorway to hell. Tom goes on to explain that, although Heisenberg may or may not have known it, CERN is an abbreviated title for an ancient Celtic deity called Cernunos. Cernunos, whose name means Horned One, is thought to be the god of death and rebirth and the lord of the underworld. He is often depicted with rings or torques around his stag-like horns or in his hands, which may symbolize the circle of destruction and restoration that he represents. To further concretize this idea, Sir Nunos is also depicted with a ring in one hand and a snake in the other. Because of the cycle by which it sheds its skin, the snake has ever been a mystical motif of death and rebirth, destruction and restoration. In a reversed esoteric adaptation, the rings of the Large Hadron Collider could be representative of the rings of Cernunos, and by further associative interpretation, may very well reveal CERN's prime esoteric objective. I believe it does, and will address it at the end of this analysis. I understand that drawing correlations between the acronym of CERN and deities from the ancient world may seem too forced and tenuous for critical minds, and I might be inclined to agree, if CERN had not evoked such correlations first. Rather than distance themselves from associations with arcane pagan deities, the directors of CERN welcomed and even celebrated the placement of a very unscientific icon in the courtyard of their main facilities. On the 18th of June, 2004, a two-meter-high statue bequeathed by the representatives of India's Department of Atomic Energy was ceremoniously unveiled at CERN. It was a statue of the Hindu god Shiva engaged in the Nataraja, the cosmic dance of destruction. Shiva is one of three members of the Trimurti, the Hindu trinity, in which the cosmic functions of creation, preservation, and destruction are personified in the forms of Brahma the Creator, Vishnu the Preserver, and Shiva the Destroyer, who is also known as the Transformer. It is important to understand that in Hindu mythology, Lord Shiva destroys the world in order to renew, restore, and reconstitute it. 
A commemorative plaque positioned next to the likeness of the dancing Shiva emblazons a quote from Austrian-born American physicist Friedrich Capra. It reads, in part, Hundreds of years ago, Indian artists created visual images of dancing Shivas in a beautiful series of bronzes. In our time, physicists have used the most advanced technology to portray the patterns of the cosmic dance. The metaphor of the cosmic dance thus unifies ancient mythology, religious art, and modern physics. Think about this, says Steve Quayle in his book True Legends. A symbolic statue of what might be a fallen angel who promises to destroy things as we know them now and rebuild a new, improved universe with a plaque basically saying the facility will be trying to unify mythology, religion, and physics. Skeptics will be quick to point out that the unifying of ancient mythology, religious art, and modern physics is only metaphorically represented in the dance of Sheba and has no practical application in the scientific activities of CERN. Again, I might be inclined to agree, except for the fact that CERN has been deliberately encouraging the coalescence of mythology, art, and physics in very bizarre ways. In 2014, a dance opera entitled Symmetry was performed and filmed at the CERN facilities, including inside of the Large Hadron Collider. Directed by filmmaker Ruben Van Leer and featuring the voice of American soprano Claren McFadden, Symmetry was a collaborative project involving not only choreographers and dancers from the production team, but many of CERN's own scientists. Once again, rather than distance themselves from arcane and mythological associations, the scientists at CERN embraced this highly esoteric and occult-laced production. One could spend hours breaking down all of the deliberate esoteric insinuations in the trailer for the film alone, but in the interest of time, let me just point out one of the more obvious details. The name of the film's protagonist is Lukas, which also happens to be the actual name of the Slovakian dancer and choreographer who plays him. Without plunging too deeply into etymological roots, the name Lukas means bringer of light, and is in fact a derivation of the Latin term Lucifer. Of course, all of this could be purely coincidental, but given the overtly esoteric nature of the film, it is highly unlikely that the name of the main character is a consequence of happenstance, regardless of the filmmaker's intention. The truth is that the occult, art, and science have always been fundamentally entwined. The natural synthesis or symmetry that binds them is perhaps best illustrated in one man, Sir Francis Bacon. Bacon, who is widely considered to be the father of modern science and the primary proponent of the scientific method, which is the very underpinning of CERN, was himself an occultist, artist, and scientist. In fact, there is reason to believe that Francis Bacon is the true face behind the dubious mask of William Shakespeare. There is, in truth, no incongruity between the material and the metaphysical world, the physical and the spiritual.
They are merely two sides of the same coin, both essential parts of the whole. When one penetrates deeply enough into what we call physics, one discovers, inevitably, the veil that separates these two realities. Occultists have always been aware of this fact. Even to Francis Bacon and his scientific contemporaries, many of whom were members of the mystery schools, deciphering the mechanisms of the material world was but the means to a far more important objective, to make contact with the entities lurking on the other side of the veil. This veil is often described as a dimensional doorway that allows access into realms beyond the perceivable world. The concept of unperceivable dimensions existing essentially in the same space we physically occupy is not only very probable but also very widely accepted in the scientific community. Many top physicists are quietly hoping that the proton collisions happening at the Large Hadron Collider will puncture the fabric of our four-dimensional confine and allow us to peek through the keyhole, as it were, into another dimension or alternate universe. Some physicists have not been so quiet about this very real possibility. During a press briefing in 2009, Sergio Bertolucci, Director for Research and Scientific Computing at CERN, made the following curious statement. The Large Hadron Collider could open a doorway to an extra dimension, and out of this door might come something, or we might send something through it. There is no question that the scientists working at CERN hope to open a dimensional doorway. The real question is, what is the something that might come through when they do. Of course, for the particle physicist, the answer is simple. They hope to discover new particles that might exist on alternate dimensional planes. There is no doubt that this is the true and honest intention of the vast majority of physicists working at CERN. The problem is, as previously illustrated, that scientists, despite their best intentions, have always been little more than expendable tools in the hands of their benefactors. The pinnacle of science for its elite occult practitioners is not discovery, but contact. There are many indications that the power players of our world, including the Vatican, are preparing to make contact with the gods of the old world. Although I have not been able to confirm the validity of the following pictures, it appears that transparent panels containing arcane texts were photographed inside the CERN facilities by a group of Portuguese students from the Santa Cecilia Music Academy. The texts have been described as greetings or invocations written in ancient languages including Aramaic, Hebrew, Mandarin, and Sanskrit. In the case of Sanskrit, the only people with the ability to read this sacred script considered to be the language of the gods are the scholars of the Vedas and Upanishads. If authentic, these panels may have been prepared for those some things that might come through the dimensional doorway. It may seem to those unfamiliar with the theoretical realm populated by obtuse equations and pipe-smoking scientists, as Horn aptly puts it, that this analysis is nothing more than hearsay, hyperbole, and wild speculation. But as any theoretical physicist worth his salt will admit, particle physics and quantum mechanics is a world in which fact and fantasy are at times indistinguishable. When it comes to CERN and its Large Hadron Collider, there is no shortage of theoretical doomsday scenarios, many of which have not been propounded by unlearned laymen such as myself, but by some of the most esteemed scientific minds in the world. The following is a brief list of the theoretical possibilities relating to the activities of CERN, and is by no means exhaustive. 
Each one of these points represents either a scientific reality or a hypothetical possibility based on incredibly complex concepts and mathematical formulas that I won't even attempt to explain or pretend to understand. Number one, black holes. Perhaps the greatest fear among theoretical physicists concerning the LHC is that it might create uncontainable miniature black holes that could descend to the core of the planet and literally devour it from within. It is important to note that black holes are only theoretical constructs and have never been proven to exist. Black holes were first discovered as purely mathematical solutions of Einstein's field equations and are not necessary in Tesla's electric universe model. To date, black holes are science fiction. Number two, antimatter weapons. Unlike black holes, antimatter is not theoretical. Not only can it be measured, but it is already being created and contained in the LHC, though in very small quantities for short periods of time, according to CERN. Antimatter has enormous explosive potential. A quarter gram of antimatter can produce an explosive yield equivalent to five kilotons of TNT. If CERN develops the capability to create and store significant amounts of antimatter, and some claim it already has, then highly destructive antimatter weapons will be developed. The advantages of antimatter bombs, for example, are very great and that they could produce atomic level explosions without residual nuclear fallout. Number three, particle beam weapons. A directed beam of high energy subatomic particles moving at extreme velocity, such as the ones produced in the LHC, is capable of obliterating matter at the molecular level. Particle beam weapons are already on the battlefield, especially in black ops warfare and the research of CERN will certainly expand and refine their military application. Number four, time distortion and stargates. It has been suggested that by colliding heavier subatomic particles, such as lead ions, which CERN will soon be doing, space and time could be distorted, creating what Einstein called a Rosenbridge or Stargate, which is basically a wormhole between two different locations, dimensions, or periods of time. It has also been suggested that such distortions in the space-time continuum could lead to what has been referred to as the Groundhog Day effect, in which time folds back on itself, allowing manipulation of the past. Number five, DNA sequencing and artificial synthesis. Since it is a fact that the Synchrotron Collider at Berkeley in Walnut Creek, California, was used to help sequence human DNA for the Human Genome Project, it is certainly feasible that the Large Hadron Collider could also be employed in a similar way, but with much more precise results. There is evidence to suggest that artificial human or human hybrid genomes have already been synthesized at collider facilities, including CERN. Number six, strangelets. Produced from a quark gluon plasma soup, sometimes generated after high energy particle collisions, strangelets are the most explosive substance in the known universe and according to theoretical physicists, were responsible for the explosion at the so-called Big Bang. Contrary to popular belief, strangelets are not theoretical, but have been confirmed to exist at the Brookhaven National Laboratory located on Long Island, New York, where physicists working with the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider, or RHIC, are attempting not only to produce strangelets, but to contain them. The potential gains of this endeavor for the military-industrial complex are self-evident. Because the LHC is a much higher energy collider than the RHIC, strangelet production and containment is even more feasible at CERN. In light of this information, 
It should give everyone watching this analysis pause when confronted with the fact that China is even now preparing to construct a super collider twice the size of the one at CERN. There can be no doubt that in the best case scenario, the world is about to witness the most dangerous and potentially deadliest arms race in human history. However, there is something percolating in occult shadows behind the scenes that is even more disturbing than a super collider arms race. When the sum of possibilities is considered, what we have at CERN ultimately is the potential to develop weapons for waging war with enemies far more powerful than mere human beings. This is the Babylon potential to which Tom Horn refers, the ability to open the forbidden gates of the gods and make war with the hosts of heaven, as was likely Nimrod's objective in the plains of Shinar. And this leads me full circle to what I believe to be the supreme hidden purpose of the Large Hadron Collider and CERN. Recall that the Celtic deity Cernunos, the horned lord of the underworld, represents the cycle of death and rebirth, of destruction and restoration. I believe that the Luciferian priesthood behind the thrones of the European Union and the United Nations intend to use CERN as the key to literally open the gates of hell in order to release the gods that have been imprisoned there those fallen watchers and arcane entities bound with change in the abyss of Tartarus. Their prime objective is the restoration of the Golden Age when the gods mingled themselves with the seed of men and their hybrid offspring ruled the earth. All of our research points inexorably to this grand conspiracy. It is my contention that the earth is even now being slowly terraformed via chemtrailing, harp, and other such clandestine programs in order to reconstitute the conditions that existed on the planet before the flood of Noah in anticipation of the hybrid race that is coming. By breaking the subatomic bonds of matter and casting away the cords that hold the material world together, Mankind will willingly tear the veil that has been established for his own protection and unleash a darkness and chaos that the earth has not seen for many ages. This is the master plan of the Luciferian elite who seek to open forbidden gates and usher in the entities that will lead them in a futile war against the Lord and against his anointed. Their great hope, and that of Lucifer's, is to usurp the throne which belongs to the Son of Man, and install the man of sin and of lawlessness in his place. Why do the nations rage, and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. The answer to the question, what is the universe made of and how did it all start? cannot be discovered by colliding particles together. The answer lies within the pages of the Bible, but not in the first chapter of Genesis, as so many suppose, but rather in the first chapter of Colossians. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him 
All things consist. I'm Timothy Alberino, and that's my analysis.